Um, I want to let everyone know you can listen to this show on KABC Radio 790 AM, and you can listen to the show on KABC.com. It's live streamed, and you can also watch it and listen to it on Facebook, Facebook Live at The Secret, How to Fight CPS and Win. If you want to call in, the number is 800 222 so let's take our first caller. Let's talk to Charnel from San Diego. Yes, hello. Hi, Charnel. Did you have a story to tell or a question to ask? Um, a question to ask. Go ahead. All right. So my question is, um, so when they first took my children, um, CPS was asking for a medical release form. Now, I don't vaccinate my, my children due to, like, autoimmune diseases in my family. Mm-hmm. And I have a doctor's note. But they still keep inquiring about that. They're, like, pushing a real huge um, – they're just pushing the issue. They said that they're going to ask the judge and stuff like that. So I'm trying to see how to combat that or maybe if I can provide a medical form to them. But I don't feel comfortable with them having access to my children's medical records. So you should get that letter from your uh, doctor and update it if possible and present that as evidence to the judge. Hopefully he or she will uh, take heed uh, because it sounds like uh, vaccinations for your children uh, might not be a positive thing. Have you been to court yet? No, that's another thing. Um, How how do we go about trying to get a court date? Because my court was April 2nd, but with this coronavirus, they're extending it. But I feel like they took our children on an emergency basis, so the least they could do is still have court for child placement. Yeah, you know, um, every county is implementing uh, different rules about hearings and stuff. So your children have already been taken. You're supposed to have a hearing within 72 hours. But we're in a pan. Yeah, I had that one. I had that one. Oh, you had that one. Okay. Yeah, I'm just waiting on the jurisdictional hearing. Okay. Well, you know, I I saw something in my email box, uh, my inbox, uh, I think it was yesterday. I think the chief judge of the state of California has closed down all of the courtrooms in California, um, including emergency hearing courtrooms, for I think one or two weeks. I'm not sure about that. You better check on that. But you can call your court-appointed attorney or email him or her and find out when your next court hearing is going to be. Uh, hopefully your children are placed with relatives or family friends, so that will lessen uh, their extended time in foster care. At least they're going to be or could be with, um, you know, people that they're familiar with. Are they in a strange foster home or with relatives or friends? They're with uh, someone that we don't know. They're saying that my mother, because I have put my mother down, they said that she has to wait for standard processing and fingerprinting and stuff like that. Okay, Um well, they could, and the judge could order that the children be placed with your mother on an emergency basis. Has uh, Was that argued at your first hearing? It wasn't, but what my uh, social worker put is that because my mother is legally blind, that, she w- that they would have to investigate her further. Okay, so, you know, I think that might be a little disability discrimination, but what you should do, and this is a strategy that I use, Uh, at my office, make a list of 25 people, their names, their addresses, and telephone numbers, and tell how they're related to the children, a family friend, family relative, and if a relative, what type of relative, and email that list to the social worker and say you want the children placed at one of these relatives' homes pursuant to Section 309 of the Welfare and Institutions Code. It's pretty hard for a social worker to find 25 people, um, you know, not able to take care of the children. And by the way, and this is the most important part, and this is part of the strategy, the people that you put on the list, they can live anywhere in the world. They don't, oh. have, they don't have to live in San Diego County. They can live really? in Orange County, huh. L.A., New York. Well, maybe not New York because of the pandemic, but, um, you know. Uh-huh. Florida, uh, Canada, Japan, um, you know, different places in Europe. So you don't have to, you know, a lot of people 
put relatives that live in Mexico because in our region, you know, there are a lot of uh, Latinos that live here from Mexico. And, you know, a lot of names when I do this uh, appear on the list from Mexico. And Mexico has a, a big federal social worker department. It's called DIF. I forget what that stands for, but it's D-I-F. And, you know, uh, social workers from California work with DIF routinely. So, um, you know, get that list together, email it to the social worker, and make the social worker do the job, you know, and investigate those people. They're supposed to do it within 30 days, you know. I don't know how that's going to work with this pandemic, but get them with uh, relatives as soon as possible. Because, you know, when children are placed in, in strange places, pe- you know, the, the system doesn't want to acknowledge this. But when they're placed in strange places, it's bad for the children. It takes an emotional and psychological toll on the children. So I'm not sure, and I'm, you don't have to tell me why they were uh, taken from you, but, you know, being in a strange foster home probably isn't the best place for them. Charnel, I hope that answers your questions. Thank you for listening, and thank you for calling in. Thank you so much. Sure. You know, um, placement of children in foster homes is one of my pet peeves because most people, not all, but most people have family and friends that can take care of these children. And I have a feeling um, that, um, you know, some of these decisions are made not to protect the children so much, but for the county to make money from the federal government. And I know a lot of people don't believe that, um, but this is in America, and even the counties want to make money. I don't know if I have enough time to take a uh, take another call. Okay, let's take a call from Passion from New York. Hi, Passion. This is Attorney Davis. Did you have a question or a story to tell? Well, I have a little of both. Okay. So my question is, I've done everything CPS asked me to. I've been doing everything from the beginning, me and my partner. But we still haven't got our kids back, and it's going on four years. Four years? Yeah, it was going on four years. So it started off with my oldest son, where I don't give visits and stuff now because they made him stay with dad. Mm -hmm. But from the beginning, it started from my oldest kid being at somebody else's house. We done everything, and then they found out that it wasn't us that abused the kid because that's what they try to blame us, us for the longest. But now they're trying to blame us again, trying to say because we didn't take, what is it called? We didn't want to take responsibility, trying to, like, make us say that we did something to our child when we didn't. Right. You know, that's an interesting argument by social workers. Here in California, you know, it's a real gray area. Uh, Whether you're going to admit or take responsibility should be used against you uh, one way or the other. And I think there are cases that go both ways. You know, some cases say you don't have to admit. Some cases say you do have to admit, so it's a very gray area here in California. It probably is like that in New York. Have you talked to a New York attorney about this situation? No, I haven't. I know I have my lawyer where he's been, like, pushing stuff because we also have, like, a caseworker that's not a good caseworker. She lies. She doesn't do what she's supposed to. And when we tell everything to the judge, like, that's the truth, she gets upset, and then she eats at my grandmother's house. It's like, it's a whole, it's a whole mess. <laughs> well, I would suggest that you contact your attorney. I don't know if you have a private attorney or a court-appointed attorney, and sit down with him or her and come up with a strategy so that you can get your t- kids back. Four years is just too long, and it's probably yep, it's- damaging your children psychologically and emotionally. It is, because the kids, that it started well the kid that it started off with were not in court for no more because i had three other kids since this whole thing happened and they removed them except for my last one i just had but they removed my other kids and they didn't have nothing to do with this case but yet we're still doing cps even though i don't see my other kids that they removed when it started Mm -hmm. well passion um Mm -hmm. i want to thank you for calling and i want to thank you for listening We're going to take our first break for the evening, pay some bills. This is The Secret, how to fight CPS and win. Okay, this is Vince Davis. This is The Secret, 
Butterfly Child Protective Services and Win. If you want to call in, it's 800-222-5222. And if you want to catch us live on Facebook, Facebook Live, it's The Secret, How to Fight CPS and Win. And I want to say hello to Vivian and Karina. And thank you for watching live on Facebook Live. Let's go to our next quest, our next caller, Beatrice from Palmdale. Hi, Beatrice. Did you have Hi, a Mr. David. Hi, did you have a story to tell or a question to ask? Uh, I guess you could say it's a little bit of both. Um, I wanted to ask um, because I know that you deal primarily with CPS cases. Um, I had my case with Palmdale DCFS, and where they wrongfully removed my kids, and they ultimately ended up keeping them with the father and giving him sole legal and um, and only allowing me day visits. And the odd thing that everybody keeps telling me is that they included in the order that it's at his discretion to allow overnights um, for us to have additional time. Um, so I've been trying um, on multiple occasions to try to see if I can get more time, you know, see if I can speak to an attorney about going to family law and trying to change the orders. On my orders, it also does say that if I have a letter from a therapist um, to state that they have reviewed all of the um, the DCFS paperwork and have the recommendations, then I can go ahead and change the order. But when I've tried to do that, um, they're not budging. And we've gone to the point, like even after they removed my kids from, DC, uh, from me, my youngest son at the time was only 11, excuse me, and um, he ended up on a suicide hold. And they completely ignored the fact that he was hospitalized and on the hold, and then they turned around and tried to blame me for it. And at that time, I only had monitored visits at the DCFS office, which blew my mind because a lot of the stuff that was coming through was just um, – a lot of made-up information. Um, they were well, Beatrice, reporting. Hold on a second. To, hold on. Do, is your CPS case closed or is it still open? It's closed right now. So m- pretty okay. much what my question is going to be is, is it is it really unlikely for me to be able to go back to family law and get these changes? Because my kids are in a really bad place right now. Okay. They're already running away from the father's home. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on a second. We want to come back. Hold on. Mm-hmm. It is not unlikely that you can get these changes made. In other words, go to family law court, file what's called a request for order to modify custody and visitation, and you'll be heard by the judge. You don't have to ask DCFS or CPS to help you. As a matter of fact, they won't help you. They're not not involved in the case anymore. And 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 from what you're telling uh, me, and and what you're telling me is, you know, you're not going to get any satisfaction from the dad, so don't even waste your time. Right. Just go to family law court. Right. Okay. Yeah, because we tried doing it um, as, like, because I even went in for a restraining order because uh, there was an issue with the father having guns and my son got access to the guns after they closed the case. Uh, that we ended up back in DCFS, and then they gave the kids right back to him. Um, and right now he's pending criminal charges. But, you know, they're still... I went to, you know, the family law and I asked for a restraining order, make sure that uh, because even the kids were coming back saying he's still talking about, you know, wanting to permanently remove me and all this other stuff. So I was worried about it because we do have a DV past. Um, So my thing was, okay, I need to protect myself, protect my kids. And um, it was denied, you know, like, and so when we tried doing that, even recently, my son's I found out that they asked my father for help, and they they applied for a restraining order, and it got denied. Also, you know, so what, we're what just family like, law court what, are you going to? To the Michael Tonovich in Lancaster. In Lancaster, uh, were you married with the father? Yes, I was. And did you guys go to court to get divorced? Yes. Okay, and did you do it at the uh, courthouse there in uh, Lancaster? Yes. Okay. So you're going to have, it looks like you're going to be stuck out there. Um, but, you know, what I would consider or recommend that you do is that you get a tr- an attorney or at least talk to an attorney, you know, for some type of uh, guidance. Because you, you right. know, you're, yeah. not, you're not going to be able to do this yourself 
uh, unless you have some type of legal experience. So don't even try, but at least go to um, call, you know, call, Google some names, get some advice at least if you can't afford to hire the attorney. If you can't afford to hire an attorney, that's what you should do. That's the optimum thing for you to do. Yeah, that's what I was thinking because even my my kids had asked my my father if he could if he could get them legal representation because they want help to get out. You know, like and right. they're worried. I mean, if they're already running away, you know, right. like I just I don't want them out on the street like that. You know, it's a gray area, but in my opinion, uh, your children can get attorneys uh, to represent them with respect to the father and his custody and visitation. Okay. But the more oh, the right. more That's the more normal practice is for you to get, you know, an attorney and go to court and inform the judge what this what these children right. are doing and what they're saying. Okay. Right. Yeah, because they have an, uh, they had well they did have um um sorry a court date for the restraining order mm-hmm. um, a few weeks ago and it got postponed because the father failed to take the kids to the hearing. Right. So, you know, um, so they did postpone it and they said, you know, of course, with the coronavirus happening, then they were going to go ahead and postpone. Now, I think that they're going to be postponing it again because I believe they were supposed to be there um, again in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, with them, they have a court date now set in April. Mine got pushed back to late May. Right. So I'm trying to see, you know, somehow if we can just find a way to get these kids and help because our kids are really, you know, um, even my youngest one, he's. He has PTSD. He was already diagnosed with PTSD, depression, anxiety. Mm -hmm. And my oldest, who's 14, he has depression and anxiety, you know, like, and they're just, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a good place for them to be at, especially under the circumstances. Right. Well, good luck, Beatrice, and God bless. Thank you for listening, and thank you for calling in. All right. Thank you so much. Let's take another call. Uh, Vanessa from Los Angeles. Vanessa. Yes. Hello. Hi. Did you have a story to tell or a question to ask? I had some questions, actually. I had some bullet points, but I first wanted to give you my condolences for Terry. This is just absolutely devastating news. I've called in a few times using different aliases, and you guys really have helped me out. And I'm very, very sorry for your loss and everybody else's in his family. I wanted to say that real fast. Well, Vanessa, thank you very much. And you don't have to use aliases. You can call in as much as you want. Well, you know, I have a a one-in-a-lifetime name, so I'm a little bit... T- intimidated okay. uh, but I would you, you invited me to talk to you in person before I'm just I've just been struggling with this case so I am six months in uh, I accepted a failure to protect charge in November um, to avoid the child abuse charge that was what was I was back in the corner um, and I wanted to say you know I, I found out through the last few months that it's a, it's a big travesty that women do not know that they it's possible for them to lose their children if they do not escape a domestic violence situation. It so certainly I am very is. passionate about this because restraining orders are being slapped and used against you. When you that should be an acknowledgement that you need help and you're finding help and you're getting grounded. Um, so I am appalled at the system. I am appalled how basic and incompetent the usual social worker can be. I have had to climb the ladder, get to supervisors to get anything done. Um, and like I said, it's been oh, six months now. My son was just now moved to his maternal grandmother's house after being in a caregiver's house for the rest of the time, being bullied, called names. I don't know if there was physical abuse. My son is very sheltered about talking about things because he's been conditioned by everybody not to explain his feelings and we're not allowed to talk about the case. Mm-hmm. So, What were the questions guess, you had for me? My question was, what do you think, especially about this COVID situation, how long do you think we're going to go without seeing our children? Because right now I'm on a FaceTime visitation schedule. Um, I believe most of the mothers or or, or parents are too as well. I think we're all being blocked access from physical visitation um, until further notice. I wanted to see if you had any information on that yet. You know, I don't, unfortunately. And, you know, I don't think that the courts know, even know how long this pandemic is going to last. You know, I heard uh, the president say that he wanted to open everything back up by Easter. But I keep hearing the doctor saying, you know, this is going to go on at least two, maybe three months. And yes. you are like a lot of people in the state of California. 
and I can imagine all over the country, because of the pandemic, you know, social workers have just canceled visits. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if that's legal or constitutional or if it's good, you know, medical practice. I just don't know. I think there could be a less restrictive alternative, you know, Mm -hmm. set up FaceTime. I know I have a case in Alameda County where the mother is being able to visit on FaceTime on an iPad. Um, But, you know, things should be... That's what we're doing. I think that's what everybody's doing right now. Is we're okay, only good. having that kind of um, virtual contact, which is great. And I mean, my perspective is I'll do anything to keep the kids safe. But obviously, having the kids being emotionally distanced from their parents is adding to you know the current stress of not even going to school anymore. Their whole right. dynamic and schedule is changing. Right. Uh, but, my second but, question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, uh, pertains to uh, filing a lawsuit uh, for certain people in my case. I, um, you know, I was, there's a lot of indifferences here that I've noticed. Uh, One being the initial investigator uh, not interviewing my mental health care providers before determining that I was too mentally incompetent to render care to my kids. Uh, As well, I did not receive a 72-hour hearing. I was given a visitation about seven days into him staying within a foreign foster home. Mm-hmm. Which he was traumatized in and possibly abused. Um, how old is so your, How old is the child? Ten, ten years old. Okay. Well, um, l- listen. So I want to get your perspective on that. Well, you know, you don't have the child back, and it's just my humble opinion. You should be focusing on that first before you go to um, suing the social workers for civil rights violations. Now, you may have a great case. I just don't know. But you know mm-hmm. what? Um, I want you to call me at my office on Monday. Okay. 888-888-6582. And we'll talk about that a little more. Okay. Right. I have several factors, and I, I'd love to come back on your show because I think some moms really need to hear some of this light that I found out. And All I appreciate right. you having the show. Vanessa, Thank you, and have a good night. Thank you, Vanessa, for calling and listening. We're going to take our second break for the evening. This is The Secret, how to fight child protective services and win. Our next call from Keisha from Fontana. Hey, Keisha, did you have yes. a story to tell or a question to ask? Um, a little bit of both. Okay, go for it. My grandchildren were taken away from my daughter a couple weeks ago. And prior to that, um, uh, she had set up a, a social worker set up a safety plan, and she spoke to me, said that uh, if I would be willing to pick up my daughter uh, because she's been in a DV uh, relationship. Mm-hmm. If I would pick up my daughter, if, if need be, and I said yes. If I would get my grandkids, and I said of course, absolutely. Okay, um, my daughter just recently had a court date. Mm-hmm. I did not get my grandchildren. Um, they were placed in a, a a facility out there in San Diego. Um, the way that the social ma- social worker made it sound like. I was going to get my grandchildren right then and there. Then they said that I had to wait a little longer. So um, during that time, uh, uh, I was told that my granddaughter uh, was being bullied in the in the facility, and now she's placed in a um, the foster person. I contacted the foster lady. Today was the first day that uh, she answered the phone. I called her like twice. Today was the first day, and I'm going to say a couple of days, um, and uh, I feel discriminative because I have a disability, and that shouldn't matter. I have raised four children, mm-hmm. and I've had my disability all my life. Keisha, let me ask you a couple of questions. Is the case in San Diego County? Yes, yes, it is. And you live in what, San Bernardino County? I live County? in the front ten- San Bernardino County. My daughter was just on earlier. Okay. I spoke to her. So let me tell you what you need to do, okay? Okay. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. I'm not sure you're going to be able to do it because you, you may not have the expertise to do it. But if you're a grandmother trying to get placement of the children who are in foster care, what you need to do is file what's called a 388 petition requesting for placement, and there's several parts to that 388 petition. The second thing is you should file what's called a de facto 
uh, parent motion. A lot of people will tell you you won't be able to file that, but under a case, what? a de facto motion. Uh huh. Um, but under a case called In Ray Charles S, any relative can file that motion and get standing in the court. The third thing uh -huh. that you should file is a JV two eighty five. You can Google that, so you can notify the court of all of the things that you want to do. And in this case, you want the kids placed with you. Okay. The, ne the next thing you should file is, a, I forget the number, it's 585 or something like that. But anyway, it's a form to petition the court to give you access to the court records. You see, these cases are confidential. And unless uh -huh. the judge gives you access, you won't know or have any of the reports or anything. You won't even know what they are saying about you unless your petition for access to the records is granted. Okay. There's an additional thing that I do, and a lot of people poo-poo this, but I, I think it's uh, as a basis in law. Um, you should file a petition for temporary and permanent legal guardianship. Okay? Oh, I can do that. Okay. I can do that from here or there? You, can, you If you fill it out and you do it properly, you can file it in San Diego County in the courthouse. Which courthouses are the kids in? Are they on Meadowlark or um, uh, East County El in El 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 Cajon? El Cajon? They're in El Cajon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, the judge in El Cajon is a very fair gentleman, uh, in my opinion. And I think he's pro-family. That's the impression that I've gotten. Um, I've appeared in front of him a few times. And my office, other attorneys in my office have appeared in front of him. But you're going to mm -hmm. have to do the right thing. I mean, if you don't do it right, you're not going to come out there with, out of there with the kids. So you got to do the right thing. If you call me Monday, I'd be willing to talk to you and maybe consult with you on what you need to do. You know, the most optimum thing for you to do is hire an attorney to uh, go into court with you and to do all this paperwork. That may be out of your budget. If it is, you know, call me and I we can consult. And I can give you some tips, okay? Okay. Um, okay, I'll call you Monday. Um, Thank you, Keisha. Yeah. The number you want to call you. is 888-888-6582. I look forward to speaking to you on Monday, Keisha. Thank you. All righty, let's take our next call from Crystal from Los Angeles. Crystal, did you have a story to tell or a question to ask? I do. I have a question to ask. Um, it's regarding my grandson. And I've been dealing with CPSS for um, about a couple years. And it's not that my grandson is in foster care, but I would like to try to get custody of him because he is in a um, really bad situation. My son is in jail right now. Um, my grandson's mother is on drugs. And I have made a couple of, you know, reports to CPSS where I've just been ignored. Well, um, is, there, is there an open case right now with DCFS? Um, there is an open case right now in Yucca Valley. There was a, dom a, dismes a domestic dispute um, about three weeks ago, and um, the sheriff went out there, and they called, um, they called CPS. And what really got me is that I didn't understand in that situation, the baby was in the studio when all this was going on, and CPS um, didn't come out to take the baby, you know, from the, from the house. Okay, Crystal, and I'm going to so, tell you what you need to do. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, it's the same thing that the prior caller, Keisha, is going through. She was a grandmother as well. You're going to have to file a 388 petition. You're going to okay. You're going to have to turn off I, your radio. Oh, sorry. I just heard. I just heard that it's really hard for grandparents to. It's not that I want my grandson to go into a foster care. I would like to try to get temporary custody of him until the mom can, you know, get off the drugs and the dad can get off the drugs. You know, so he's just not. You know, he's still with his mom, and she's still, like, doing the drug. So what okay, Krista, kind of rights do I have? You, you have rights. You have legal rights. You're going to have to enforce them legally, though, and that's by filing certain petitions and motions to the juvenile court. 
in order for the court to have a hearing so that you can present your evidence that the child should be placed with you and not with the mother. That, okay. can, that can be done. I suggest you don't talk to the social workers because the social workers sometimes tell you information that's not accurate or not true. Um, right. or, or may, for whatever reason, you know, want to keep the child you know, with the mother for some odd reason. I've seen stranger things. So if you have the evidence that the mother is still on drugs and still using drugs, you need to move forward um, as soon as possible. You know, the optimum thing would be for you to get an attorney to represent you in this case. Uh, you wouldn't be entitled to a court-appointed attorney, but you could hire an attorney who could go in and do what needs to be done and try to prove to the judge that the child should be taken from the mother and placed with you. Okay. 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 Um, is there a number that I can call? or how Sure. Could... You, you can call me on Monday. It's 888-888-6582, 888 And, Crystal, when you call, make sure that you tell the receptionist that you want to speak to me personally. Otherwise, you may be given to yeah, someone I'll else in my office, speak with... and I won't okay. even know that you would have, you would have called. Okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal, for listening, and thank you for calling in. Okay. Have a nice evening. You too. You know, I'm getting a lot more calls, even at my office, and emails from grandparents who are trying to get their grandchildren out of foster care or out of dangerous situations. Kind of have a soft heart, in, you know, for grandparents. I was raised by my paternal grandparents. So I always try to help these grandparents out with these cases. All right, my engineer's saying we got to take the break for the next uh, the next commercial break. This is the secret: how to fight child protective services and when. Okay, this is Attorney Vincent Davis. We're back. The secret: how to fight child protective services and when. Let's go right to our next call, Tony from Corona. Yes, hello. Tony, did you have a story to tell or a question to ask? Um, I guess a, a question and story. Um, so now my question is, um, can we um, file like CPS on the CPA? All right, so right now I have a case going. Uh, my son was removed um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, they gave me a reunification plan. I completed the plan. And my son, he's still not home. Now I'm like starting to be concerned on what's going on at the foster um at the foster house he's in. So now my question was, let's say um would I be able to go to CPS and then file um an, an investigation on that? Yes, you can file a complaint against CPS at the county level, at the state level in Sacramento, and at the federal level in Washington D C. You can file in Washington, D.C. with the Department of Health and Human Services. You can also file with the um, Justice Department if you think civil rights have been violated. And you can file in Sacramento. By the way, filing in Sacramento um, with the Department of Social Services, they take these complaints very seriously and they do investigate them. In my experience, filing a complaint at the local level, at the county level, is not yeah. very effective because it's the county investigating yeah. the county. You know, what are you yeah. going to expect on that? But, yeah. yes, you can file those complaints. Now, is it, now do we have, do we, is, this, is this something that um, I would have to be living in Sacramento or something I'd be able to file? No, no, there? no. You just have to have a case in California, which you do. Okay. And you can just file with the Department of uh, Social Services. You could Google it. They have a... They have a hotline, I think, where you can file a complaint online or on the telephone uh, against a county social worker, CPS social worker. Okay, now, is, now, is that, now, would that be a, a way, like, would I be able to, see, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get my son back. It's just at this point, um, you know, they, and they ended up um, uh, is it, uh, terminating my services, and, you know, but they still they they didn't send for adoption, um, and but now I like I can't even make it to his uh, medical appointments. They're not letting me see him. Tony, why isn't the child placed with a relative or a family friend? You know what? Um, that I'm not sure. 
Okay, well, you need to find that out as soon as possible. You need to have a meeting with your attorney and find okay. out. There is a yeah. lot that can be done. And by the way, the yeah. relative or family friend doesn't have to live in Riverside County. They can live in San Francisco. They can live in Washington. They can live in Minnesota, Florida, New Mexico, Arizona. They can even live in another country. Yes. Canada, Mexico, you know. So you need to have that conversation with an attorney as soon as possible. If now, if your attorney is not, you know, giving you the help that you need, give me a call and maybe I can help you and assist yes. you. Okay. I've given the uh, number out, but my t- my yes. office number is 888-888-6582. And if you call, tell the receptionist you want to speak to me personally. Okay. And tell the receptionist, hey, I talked to Vince on the radio uh, Saturday night and he told me to call. So if you okay. call, I'll uh, talk to you on Monday. Uh, All right, sounds good. Most courts Thank are you. closed, so I'm working from home, my man. So I'll be available. All right, sounds good. I will, thank you. I will call you. Thank right. you for listening, and thank you for calling in. Let's take our next call from Michelle from the Antelope Valley. Michelle, did you have a story to tell or a question to ask? I do. Um, I have both, actually. Um, about two, well, last month, um, I have a 17-year-old son. Him and his stepfather got into a fight. First time it's ever gotten physical. First time they even had a fight like this. Mm -hmm. It was so bad that I protected my son. I called the sheriff Mm -hmm. and had my husband removed. Mm -hmm. He is now removed from the home, Mm -hmm. not living here. There is a restraining order. I went and talked to the victims, the special victims unit. She got a statement from my son. She got a statement from me, said that DCFS would have to come out. She said that they would, they already knew about the situation. They wouldn't be coming at me like they normally do on a hotline call. They've already been in correspondence. She told me all this. Then when he comes out two weeks later, he came out very adversarial, mm-hmm. like I was the, the bad parent. Right. I kept telling, and before, when he came to the door, I told him, I'm recording everything. He said, sure, that's fine. I have the whole interview with me and him, my son, everything is recorded. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, he did say that, yes, I'm the non-offending parent, and that he was assured that I did everything right. I protected my son. He was going to close out the case. They are, I'm sorry, it was not even an, a case, it's an investigation, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, he said, I get a letter in the mail in one or two weeks. It's been over two weeks. I haven't gotten anything. Now, is it just because maybe this whole coronavirus thing going on that maybe it's delayed? Um, right. I, 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 I'd, I'd be guessing on that. Um, if I had to guess, I'd probably say yes. You know, uh, this corona thing has uh, impacted uh, services like DCFS. Uh, and CPS all throughout the state, if not the country. Um, mm-hmm. They haven't taken your son away, right? He's still with you? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So what I might do is make a uh, send an email and ask for a closing letter. doesn't sound like a case where there should be, you know, court involvement. And, uh, right. you know, your son is 17, almost 18. The stepfather's out of the home. So it sounds like everything's okay. Right. It's just um, after he said that, oh, everything's fine, you're going to be getting a letter, um, then he calls me and wants me to drug test in two days. I said, no, I want to do it now. No, no, you don't have to drug drug test. Oh, well, I I did it because I'm not used to this kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I have nothing to hide. So You don't have to drug drug test. test. Well, I did, and it was negative. Okay, perfect. um, then uh, Then he... then asked me information that he already asked. And he started asking questions that he already asked on the interview. You like, know, if I were like you. he wasn't even here writing it down. And then he asked about visitations that he had to visit. But he's asking about people that weren't even involved in this whole situation. Yeah. So is he, like, fishing? Is he fishing for something? Or is, he's or fishing is big he time. Like, he's fishing big huh? time. I wouldn't talk to him any further. And I'd ask you, I'd ask him for the letter of the case closure. 
There's nothing more he can do, and he shouldn't be nosing around and fishing for other things. So just tell okay. him that, okay? Is that my right, or is that is absolutely? He gonna is he going to be like oh. now? That's a good question. If he's going to retaliate, um, I've known seen cases where uh, social workers retaliate big time. But in your particular case, what you're telling me, there's nothing to retaliate against. The stepfather's out of the house. The guy, your son is 17, probably going to turn 18. And if they turn, yeah, and if they he turns 18, there's no no juvenile court involvement, no CPS involvement. Michelle, just ask him for the closing letter. If he has any problems, give me a call, and maybe I can help you out by making a call for you. Okay. That would be great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening, and thank you for calling in. Let's try to take one more call before we end the show. Uh, we got about three minutes left, according to my engineer. Let's talk to Janet from Los Angeles. Hi. Janet, Hi. did you have a story uh, to tell or a question to ask? Yeah, I, w- I want to know, like, uh, what do we do, like, when we're, let's say, we have visitation and we're scared to go because every time I go, like, um, they, they, they're not treating me fairly. They're, they're breaking my visitation rights. They're telling me to take care of the... Uh, like, like, uh, watch, uh, like, visit your kid in front of our door instead of like taking them outside or even downstairs in the building. Right. How we deal with anxiety and depression going through this? Okay, so first thing you have to do is you have to send an email to your attorney to ask him or her to help you out with the situation. The next thing that I would do is I'd file a complaint with the county. I'd file a complaint with the Department of Social Services in Sacramento. And I'd file a complaint with the Department of Health and Human Services and possibly this, the, um, the Justice Department if there had been violation of civil rights. And believe me, if you do those things, you will get uh, – your problem will be addressed. Okay? Yeah, so health, health department? No, no, no. I said the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. Just Google it. Okay? Okay. Washington, D.C., um, Health and Human Services. Department of Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C. Okay. Department of Health and, and Human Services. Yes. And thank you so much. I appreciate it. Janet, thank you for listening and thank you for calling in. I appreciate it. All righty. We have a couple minutes left. Um, I want to stress to the audience um, about the importance of voting. Uh, In California, as you probably know, judges are elected, and if they were appointed, they have to face re-election. I don't know if it's every four or six years. So it's important that you vote regarding judges. Also, it's important that you vote with regarding to state legislators. They make the laws. They modify the laws regarding how you are treated in court by CPS and by the juvenile judges. So use your power to vote. I want to thank everybody listening, and don't forget we're going to say a prayer for Terry Greenstein uh, and his family. This has been The Secret, how to fight child protective services and when. We'll see you next week on the radio.